Hi, everyone. My name is Salman Kishavji. I'm a professor in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, and I wanted to invite, wanted to welcome everyone to, um, to today's pro seminar in social medicine. Uh, as a little bit of housekeeping, I just want to mention that we are videotaping this session. So if you do not want to be uh, videotaped, please turn off your videos, and then you won't be captured by the recording. So today, we're, we're very fortunate to have two uh, fantastic speakers, Professor David Jones and Professor Nancy Oriel. And um, before they speak, I just want to spend a minute introducing them to people who may not know them. So Professor David Jones is the Bernard Ackerman Professor of Culture of Medicine in the Faculty of Medicine and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And he's trained as a psychiatrist and a historian of science. And he teaches history of medicine and medical ethics at Harvard College and at Harvard Medical School. David's had an amazing career. He actually started uh, his career looking at Cold War medical ethics when he studied human subjects injected with plutonium or exposed to nuclear tests in Nevada. And then after that, he focused his work on epidemics among uh, American Indians, which gave rise to a, a fantastic monograph called Rationalizing Epidemics, Meanings and Uses of American Indian Mortality Since 1600. And in this work, he actually examined European initiated epidemics that led to incredible suffering among different native populations. And he looks at the spread of smallpox, the prevention of smallpox, tuberculosis, et cetera, the use of new antibiotics amongst the Navajo. So a really fantastic work. And most recently he's been working on, uh, he wrote a book called Broken Hearts, The Tangled History of Cardiac Care, which examines the history of cardiology and cardiac surgery. And he's actually working, he's, he's very prolific. He's working on, on four other histories, the evolution of coronary artery disease, of heart disease and cardiac therapeutics in India, the threat of air pollution to health in India, and the history of air pollution research in the United States. So we're really grateful to have David uh, today, who will be our first presenter. And then we also have Professor Nancy Oriel, who, uh, who is the Faculty Associate Dean for Community Engagement in Medical Education at Harvard Medical School. She is a professor of anesthesia in the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. And she's also a lecturer in the Department of Social, uh, Global Health and Social Medicine. So Professor Oriel has had just an incredible impact on healthcare on a large scale. You know, over 40 years as an anesthesiologist, researcher, author, lecturer, educator, innovator, she's actually worked, you know, to, to, to improve health disparities and access uh, she's worked on education, you know, cultural education, biomedical literacy in minority and socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. Um, she's also has a long history of public service. In the early 1990s, she launched what's known as the Family Van, which is a mobile health clinic that serves local Boston communities. And, and it's not just dealing with medicine, it deals with health education, counseling, preventive services, of course, screening for, you know, cholesterol and blood pressure and diabetes and obesity. Um, she's all, you know, and, and, and really created a model for community health worker staffed clinics uh, in, 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 in different communities in Boston. She's also worked to advance medical education at Harvard Medical School. She created a clerkship that embeds uh, senior medical students in community based organizations in Boston and Alaska and New Orleans. And she's just been a force in social medicine. And we're so honored to have her here with us today. So let me uh, invite uh, Professor David Jones to start, and then we'll have Professor Oriel respond. David. So Nancy and I have a daunting task uh, here, as, as Salman had outlined. The official title we were given for our talk was Historical Perspectives on Race and Disease. And after thinking about that over the course of this fall, I've decided that I will expand that title into a mandate for a broader conversation uh, about historical perspectives on social medicine and the problems of race and racism. Our comments and my comments and Nancy's comments that follow are of course not meant as a definitive statement on this subject. I don't think such a thing is possible. The conversation that we're having in this series about race and social medicine has already been begun by Alan several weeks ago and then by Joya and Michelle last week. And I'm sure that it will continue through many of the talks that follow. Now, I will acknowledge at the outset that many people will think I am exactly the wrong kind of person for this. You know, why would I want to talk about race and disease? As, as Salman had said, my research over the past 25 years, one of the focuses has been on these questions of race and disease. 
But of course, the reasons for why you might be skeptical of me are the obvious ones. I'm a white man, part of systems of white supremacy and privilege. And since my time in grad school, I've been told repeatedly that I am not the right person to be talking about race and medicine. So one thing I want to try to do is to explain why I have persisted and why I believe that the problems of race and racism need to be the focus of everyone's attention and everyone's work if we're going to make any progress with these difficult questions. So I'll begin with a broad overview of how race and racism have been woven into the analyses and missions of social medicine. Uh, I'll talk briefly about how we struggle with some of this in our own medical school here at Harvard and in Boston, and then outline various ways that we, we can engage, work that I have done and our colleagues have done. And then Nancy will then share her perspective based, as you'd heard from Salman, on a long career on the forefront of this work. So I first encountered social medicine in the fall of 1993 as a first year medical student at Harvard Medical School. And at the time I was taught the framework that you heard Alan mention in his talk, the three pillars of social medicine of the sort that Arthur and Alan and Byron and Leon Eisenberg and Mary Jo and others taught at that time about the social production of disease, the social meanings of disease, and the social responses to disease. Now, I've been thinking about this and I don't remember sitting in these classrooms, that race was a specific focus of their work or this analysis, but it was still a pervasive presence. It wouldn't have been at the, the top of the list if you said, Are, do you consider yourself a race scholar? I don't think any of them would have said yes. But of course, as Alan had described, uh, his work had done, had made important contributions to our understanding of Tuskegee. Uh, anyone who was at all in the orbit of Partners in Health and the Institute for Health and Social Justice in the 1990s uh, would have come across Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative, the various conferences that Paul hosted uh, at the Institute for, at, at PIH uh, in their annual conferences. And it's very easy to map problems of race and racism onto these frameworks of social medicine. So let me talk about this issue of the social production of disease. One of the things that anyone, I think, in the field of social medicine would say they do is apply, apply critical social theory to the problem of disease. And if you do that, especially looking at the history of the United States, you cannot avoid the problem of race. For over 500 years, people in this continent have observed race-based health disparities in the Americas. First with the indigenous populations that the Europeans found when they arrived here, and then with the Africans who were enslaved and brought here for their labor. So for over 500 years, white observers and now others have been describing and debating the causes of the mortality that followed in the enslaved Africans or in the American Indians. And many scholars, even now, make what Paul Farmer would call immodest claims of causality. Jerry Diamond won the Pulitzer Prize for a book in which he essentially dismisses American Indian mortality as an accident of continental geography. Uh, Larry Summers, in one of his many regrettable statements when he was still president of the university, to stop, describe the depopulation of the Americas as a coincidence. <clears throat> Scholars in social medicine, myself included, and our allies in history and anthropology have pushed back against these irresponsible accounts of what happened to the American Indians and the enslaved Africans. I have done work to critique the theory of virgin soil epidemics and argued with many others that the problem was not that Indians were born vulnerable to these diseases, but that they were made vulnerable to these diseases by the conditions of conquest and colonization. Scholars in these fields have increasingly used the language of genocide to describe what happened. Personally, I, I, I balk at that. I'm not convinced that genocide is the right term to describe everything that happened everywhere in the Americas, some places more so than others, uh, but I might simply be too cautious as a scholar, and it could be the case that genocide is the right term to describe what happened. And it's easy to celebrate the kind of work that many of our heroes have done to document the social origins of disease. Uh, unfortunately, many of these analyses, even within social medicine, have themselves been tainted by racism. Rudolf Virchow is someone who we often like to identify as the, the founding father of the field of social medicine. And in 1848, as many of you have read, he was sent to Silesia in what is now Poland to investigate an outbreak of typhus. And he offered primarily a biopsychosocial analysis that we all appreciate, blaming the problems of this epidemic 
on the nature of uh, Prussian colonialism uh, in Silesia and the consequences of structural poverty on this population. And he wrote many of the quotations that many of us have cited many times in our own work and lectures, that physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor and social problems to a large extent fall within their jurisdiction. This has, in many respects, been one of the founding quotations of our field. <clears throat> but Virchow was also deeply, deeply racist towards the Silesians whom he had been sent to investigate. He condemned their, their squalor, their sloth, their canine subservience, their unwillingness to work. Uh, he concluded that, he said, you know, that their completely canine subservience is so repulsive to any free man accustomed to work that he feels disgust rather than pity. Now, I haven't yet attempted a systematic history of this question of, of racism within the fabric of social medicine, and someone certainly should. It would be an important project to do, but there are plenty of other skeletons in our closets. Uh, Rene Dubose uh, is a hero of 20th century American social medicine, especially for the many of us who have been interested in the problems of tuberculosis. Uh, his 1952 book, likely regrettably titled White Plague, talks about how tuberculosis was a great problem facing the white race or the European race. As Solomon and Paul and everyone knows, this is not at all a white disease. <clears throat> you have to turn to the back of the book, Appendix E, to see his awareness of the race problem. You can look at that graph and you can see that Dubose knew well that at every age, mortality of tuberculosis was higher in the non-white population than in the white population in this country. And yet he titles the book, The White Plague and talks almost exclusively about white in his text. Now, supposedly, I haven't been able to track this down because I don't have access to the library. Our predecessor in this work, Barbara Gutmann Rosenberg, I'm sorry, Rosencrantz, uh, wrote in a, a forward to a reprint of this edition. And there she hints that DuBose had actually drafted a chapter on races and people, but left it out of white plague. And so I'm trying to track down that prehistory, but I won't be able to do that until the libraries reopen. Uh, his other book, Mirage of Health, uh, I think is a little better. He endorses virgin soil theory, much to my chagrin, uh, and describes how Europeans had developed a racial resistance that left American Indians and Pacific Islanders especially vulnerable. Now, I don't think we should cancel Virchow or Dubose. I don't think that would be to the advantage of anyone. What we need is an understanding of the role of race and racism in their work and in the canon of social medicine in part as a reminder of how difficult these issues are. Uh, it has often become politically correct in medicine now to assert that race is a social construct. But as Troy Duster, you know, one of the country's most prominent African-American sociologists, and many others will argue it is misleading and potentially dangerous to say that race is just a social construct because as social epidemiologists and medical anthropologists have shown, race and racism structure nearly everything in American society. These are potent forces uh, that have real consequences. The social exposures become embodied and internalized. They alter our bodies. We cannot turn our attention away from these problems. <clears throat> this raises another historical question that I would love to see someone do, uh, a history of this discourse on the social determinants of health. As far as I know, these frameworks have always considered race as a variable. Uh, in the past five years or so, you start to see racism showing up as a category in the social determinants of health. And I would love to know when that began to happen and why. You know, the work of someone like Nancy Krieger would be important. I suspect she was one of the first to put racism on these maps of social determinants. Uh, but it would be fascinating to move beyond the usual canon of mostly white theorists and try to get a sense of how this question looks from different perspectives. Alan gave a call out to W.B. Du Bois, Joya to Fanon and Mumbembe. I think there's a lot of work that could be done to try to understand how racism has figured into or not the theorizing of social medicine. <clears throat> and again, on, on this issue of complexity, uh, we do need to face the possibility that ancestral genetics mm -hmm. and the complicated ways in which that does or does not correspond to race might actually be relevant. Uh, I have, uh, much to my chagrin, been involved with the project through Megan Murray uh, with her colleagues at the Broad Institute, uh, who may have found a link between native Peruvian ancestry and tuberculosis progression uh, that could not be explained by the usual suspects of socioeconomic status, housing, and the many other variables they studied. Uh, 
I'm a bit suspicious and worried about this finding, but it does seem to be robust. And this article has now been submitted for publication and it's available uh, on MedArchive. Now, the, the second pillar of social medicine about the social meanings of disease, this is where it's easiest uh, to explore these questions of race and racism, uh, as seen in Alan's work on stigma and the work that many others have done. Race and disease are both stigmatized in the United States, in American culture, and there are many examples of the complex feedback loops between race, disease, and stigma. And so, for instance, in the early 20th century, uh, African Americans were seen as prone to syphilis, Mexicans and Jewish immigrants were prone to tuberculosis, and the association of those groups with these diseases further the stigmatization of those groups. And then meanwhile, the fact that a disease is often associated with a stigmatized group leads to stigmatization of that disease. You can see this most famously with AIDS in the 1980s in which the disease accrued the stigma that already existed because of homosexuality or intravenous drug use. And this stigmatization of AIDS contributed to the fact that Ronald Reagan didn't mention the term for the first four years of the American epidemic. And others have done all very important work on other diseases. Jonathan Metzl has a terrific book about how in the 1960s, schizophrenia became first racialized and then stigmatized into the disease that we now know today. And this gets to this third pillar, the social responses to disease. Uh, at first pass, I think this is largely a history that social medicine can be proud of. Explanations of disease offered by scholars in social medicine have largely focused on context, on history, on political economy, and the social interventions that we have recommended have often followed suit from these broad biopsychosocial analyses. So just, for instance, despite his very low regard for this lesions, Virchow made what I think most of us would say are the right recommendations. He called for full and unlimited democracy, realizing that might not happen overnight. He called specifically for the Prussian government to provide medical care, food, blankets, money, clean housing, and all those sorts of things. <clears throat> now, I don't think he actually made any effort to follow through to see if his recommendations were pursued at all by the Prussian government. He did his investigation and left, uh, which isn't a model we would wholly recommend. Uh, but I think if anyone who did similar reading in the works of the other key figures in American social medicine, Henry Sigarest, George Rosen, Rene DeVos, you would come away with a clear sense that these were people who were committed to using disease as a motiv motivating factor for broad social reform that would lead to improvements across society. And scholarship in these areas has done tremendous work to document uh, the toxic impact of race and racism on public health policy again, with an eye towards offering correctives. So Nyan Shah has shown how anti-Chinese racism fueled what was really a boneheaded response to the outbreak of plague in San Francisco in 1900. Others have shown how plague was used as a justification for the early efforts to segregate South Africa before the apartheid system was implemented. Uh, there's been recent work showing how lack of access to care to medicine or nursing on the Navajo reservation led to extremely high mortality from influenza in 1918. The epidemic in general uh, hit white populations as, as hard as it hit African-Americans or immigrant groups, but it was the American Indian population who had the unusual susceptibility to that ep epidemic in 1918. And there are many social medicine reasons for why that happened. <clears throat> but again, the situation here quickly becomes complicated. So when I took my first social medicine class in 1993, and Scott Podolsky was in the class with me then, I suspect this was the curve we were most asked to remember by Rob Martinson, who was the professor of the course then, uh, the Thomas McEwen's famous graph of the decline of tuberculosis from England and Wales. McEwen is a complicated figure. He was a leading proponent of social medicine in the United Kingdom. He worked to reorient the National Health Service away from acute care towards providing chronic care. He wasn't a critic of medicine per se, only of certain kinds of medicine. And his intent here was really the mission of people who advocate for the social determinants of health. We need to up address upstream variables, especially poverty, if we're going to com combat disease. His message, however, was co-opted by neoliberals during the Reagan era conservatism. Uh, and McCune be, came to be seen as someone who was arguing 
for a laissez-faire approach uh, to public health, what's come to be called public health nihilism, the argument that we should focus on economic growth and let that solve all of the world's problems. McCune has become contentious within this department for a different reason. Uh, he had argued that me medical measures were not the solution to tuberculosis. But as Paul and Joya and Salman and many others who have worked in places where tuberculosis persisted into the late 20th century knows well, powerful pharmaceuticals can be decisive for tuberculosis, even in conditions of poverty. And they have advocated aggressively for widespread access to tuberculosis treatment. And this was paralleled by work for HIV. There were years of advocacy, whether it was by the ACT UP branch in Philadelphia, the Treatment Access Coalition, and many others, uh, led to demands that the US change its policy and eventually culminated in President Bush launching PEPFAR in 2003. And I assume everyone here would consider this program to be a great success. Millions of lives have been saved by this delayed investment in the US in making AIDS therapy available worldwide. But this often gets blamed. Uh, for instance, you'll, you'll hear this at the biannual MD-PhD social science conferences that take place every so often. For a variety of reasons, uh, partners in health often becomes critiqued uh, for being complicit in the pharmaceuticalization of public health. The concern is that by focusing so much on access to treatment, the broad social vision has been lost. Now, I don't think this critique is correct or fair. Uh, and the fact that it's always coming from uh, young people who are trying to establish themselves in the field makes me wonder if there's something Oedipal about this. They have to kill off Paul before that they will be able to succeed in their own right. I'm not sure exactly the psychology of this. In my eyes, the agenda of Partners in Health has always been to pursue both treatment access and social reform simultaneously. Uh, and this figures in to race in a variety of ways. The liberation theology that motivated Paul and Jim in the 1990s demanded a preferential option for the poor. Since the poor in this world are often dark skinned, this call becomes uh, a de facto call for race justice. <laughs> but again, despite these successes, and the many lives that have been saved, I don't think anyone would be willing to declare a total victory. Profound disparities still exist on a global scale with access to AIDS treatment or tuberculosis. And these things can even be seen within our community. It is true in the United States that the advent of antiretroviral therapy led to a dramatic drop in mortality from AIDS, but there is an enormous race disparity. Um, I don't know what the current ratio is, but those of you who, who taught with Heidi Beferus when she was still here will always remember her admonition to us that the mortality rate of a black woman in Roxbury with AIDS was 13 times higher than that of a white man in Boston with AIDS. And how could this be possible? And why weren't we doing more to overcome this? <clears throat> Heidi's, by shining the spotlight of this on, in Boston, I think Heidi did important work to remind us the extent to which we need to focus not just on these global problems, but also on our very local problems if we're going to make progress. <clears throat> and there's much that needs to be done to get our own house in order. Now, Harvard Medical School was founded in 1782, not explicitly, but de, de facto by white men for white men. Uh, that's how the power was uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In 1850, Harvard Medical School did admit three African-American students, uh, expecting that they would then go off and do their medical work in Liberia, uh, not stay within Boston. The white medical students rebelled against this uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was then the dean, caved in, and those students were expelled. As the students explained here, you know, we deemed the admission of Blacks to the medical lectures highly detrimental to the interests and welfare of this institution. Holmes had initially resisted this, but later uh, conceded, conceded the point. Now, this policy was sort of reversed. Small numbers of Black students were admitted first in 1868. But the medical school didn't just have a race problem, it also had a gender problem. Women were not admitted until 1944, uh, which is quite recently. And only then because of World War II, the medical school was unable to fill its class with men because the men were drafted. And so they grudgingly admitted women into Harvard Medical School. Uh, and the first black woman wasn't admitted until 1951. 
Now, attempts to correct this have been made. In 1969, a faculty initiative uh, led by our own Leon Eisenberg called out the racist structures in the US society and pushed Harvard Medical School to diversify. Uh, as Leon wrote, all of us have tolerated if we have not created a social structure whose outcome has been racist, whether it was consciously intended or not. To the victim, it has mattered little whether the outcome was intended. The medical school faculty took up a collection to pay for scholarships for poor minority students. David Potter, who was my neuroscience professor, traveled the country recruiting minority applicants to try to get them to Harvard Medical School. And this led to a lasting change in the student body. Uh, when I entered in 1993, uh, Harvard Medical School had become a majority minority class. There were more women than men, more non-white students than white students. But faculty diversity has not followed suit. Uh, students at the medical school realize that there is little diversity in the teaching faculty, in the course directors, in the senior ranks of the faculty, especially the quad faculty and the department chairs and in the dean's office. Uh, the medical school has tried to fix this for years, uh, but I don't think it can escape the critique that it hasn't tried hard enough to succeed. There have been small successes. Uh, recently, students petitioned the dean to rename the Oliver Wendell Holmes Society in honor of William Augustus Hinton. The, yes, Holmes had made many contributions to medical science and education of the sort uh, that he was someone who traditionally the medical school would have valued. Uh, but he also held racist views towards enslaved people and American Indians. When the students uh, petitioned the dean to make this change, they used history as part of that petition. Uh, Scott Podolsky was then asked to do a follow-up investigation to see what merits this had. Uh, and Scott produced a much more thorough and nuanced analysis, but still a damning analysis of the many aspects of Holmes that we should not uh, celebrate by enshrining him as one of the people for whom a society is named. And so last month, the Oliver Wendell Home Society was renamed the William Augustus Hinton Society. And this is progress, uh, but it still doesn't address the fundamental problems that we have at the medical school. George Daly now seems to be committed to making the medical school an anti-racist institution. He has established a whole series of working groups. Uh, the question is, you know, what can we do? Uh, the problem of faculty diversity is difficult. Since most of the faculty are hospital-based, and an overwhelming share of the 12,000 faculty are employed by the hospitals, the medical school says this is a hospital problem that the medical school itself can't fix. <clears throat> Harvard Medical School requires quad departments to raise huge sums of money to do new searches, so our department can't simply hire 10 new people to diversify it. Uh, but even when we have done searches recently, we haven't uh, succeeded in diversi diversifying the faculty. Over the past decade, the department has done five searches that led to seven hires, four men and three women, uh, but none, none of the seven people who have been hired, myself included, would count as underrepresented in medicine. You could say money needs to be available. Uh, money is always tight. The medical school, however, just received a $200 million gift from the Blavatnik Family Foundation. $200 million could be used to hire 30 new minority faculty that would expand the faculty, the quad faculty by 20% and transform this institution. But that is not at all what the medical school is planning to do with that money. <laughs> so what can we do then with the faculty that we have? Uh, faculty can commit to work for the poor and the marginalized populations in the US and worldwide. And many of our faculty, whether Paul Farmer or Nancy Oriel have been exemplars of this effort to do what we can with the resources that we have. <clears throat> Uh, some of us, uh, and I put myself in this bucket, see our strengths as scholars, not as implementers, but there's work that we can do now, uh, that we can do too. So for instance, in 2016, when Jeff Flyer stepped down, the Racial Justice Coalition of Harvard Medical Students petitioned President Drew Faust, uh, asking her to consider hiring someone other than a white man as dean. Harvard Medical School has never had anything other than white men as deans. Uh, they based this petition on the history of Oliver Wendell Holmes' de decision to expel black students and Paul, Scott and I all helped them with research and strategy on this uh, initiative. Now it didn't have the desired outcome, but it was clear that this had been put firmly onto the agenda of the president of the university. 
I have done a variety of things over the years to try to help students explore questions that they have, especially about this issue of race and disease. So for instance, in 2016, three of the first year students, Cameron, Nutt, Donna Caberi, and Leo Eisenstein, got interested in the ways in which race is used in diagnostic testing. Uh, they focused on three factors, glomerular filtration rates, pulmonary function tests, and a, uh, an indicator of bone strength. And in each of these tests, the, race, the outcomes of the test are adjusted based on the race of the patient. Uh, so there's a race adjustment uh, algorithms. <clears throat> they were unable to get their work published for a variety of reasons, which was very frustrating to the scholar and me. But they were able to collaborate and ally with Melanie Honig, uh, a nephrologist at the Beth Israel Hospital. And in 2017, uh, they got the BI to stop race correction for glomerular filtration rate. That was the first country in the hospital to do so. Uh, Cameron and Melanie and others petitioned MGH and Brigham to consider making this change. But at the time, both of those hospitals refused to. Other students picked up on this work, sometimes directly inspired by the work that the Harvard students were doing. Uh, some, of this, some of them came to this problem independently. And so this push against race correction for glomerular filtration rate uh, quickly became a national movement at a few medical centers across the country, at Penn, UCSF, University of Washington. <laughs> and eventually, uh, this has ha led to some changes. As I said, MGH and the Brigham initially refused to make the change, but this past summer, uh, they have now announced that they're no longer going to race correct EGFR. And about a half a dozen other hospitals have made the same change. And meanwhile, I was approached by another student who had been part of the Racial Justice Coalition, Darshal Vias. Uh, about something that she had observed on her obstetrics rotation, the ways in which race was used uh, in various risk calculators that were used to determine whether it was safe for a woman who had had a prior C-section to attempt a trial of labor. It's called the VBAC calculator. Uh, and it's a clunky formula, but if you look at this, you can see that what it does is it estimates that if the woman is either African-American or Hispanic, they are at higher risk. The risk calculator is race adjusted. It determines it, it delivers a different result based on race and ethnicity, and that would discourage these minority women from attempting a trial of labor. We collaborated with obstetricians at the Brigham, and after a tremendous amount of work and frustration, this one we were able to get published. And after that, Darshali pitched the idea of doing a broader review. Instead of doing deep dives into individual calculators, what would be the, the value of just compiling a list to show how broad this pro problem is? And so she compiled a list of 20 or so examples of race correction and diagnostic tools. Uh, we wrote this up, uh, recruited Leo to help us finish it off, uh, and the, the stars aligned in various ways. Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine was interested in, in running this piece, uh, and it was published in June uh, at the height of the George Floyd protests and has gotten much more attention than we ever expected that it would. And the response to this has been totally fascinating. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on some of these responses during the discussion. One of the we have critiques we've heard a few times is that we, we should not have published this without a Black co-author. Uh, identity politics in this country are interesting and, and complicated. Another critique that came in, and these are all from letters that the New England Journal of Medicine decided not to publish, <laughs> was that we shouldn't drop race from consideration not because race is a useful proxy for genetics, which is the usual argument, but because race is a useful proxy for racism. It's hard to measure racism. It's easy to measure race. Therefore, by measuring race, we're somehow cataloging the work that is done by racism. Many other people, including prominent African-American physicians, have argued that we should continue to use a race because it's important in various ways. For instance, uh, nephrologists in Boston have been almost uniformly opposed to the desire to stop race corrupting EGFR. They think it should be restored. Uh, the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephr Nephrology have a working group that's working on this, and I'm not sure which way they're going to decide. Uh, the Osteoporosis Foundation was quite angry with our article. They said, we are completely wrong. We misunderstand how the tool is used. Uh, for the life of me, I've read this article many times. I can't understand their critique. Uh, a group at the Brigham might dig into this and offer a rebuttal, and I hope that they do. Pulmonary function tests have found defenders. Uh, one letter, point, letter pointed out uh, 
<laughs> that the difference you see between blacks and whites in pulmonary function tests is an empirical fact. We cannot ignore it. And they said that we misconstrued what was going on. They don't actually race correct the measured values in the way that the kidney nephrologists do. They just compare the measured values to race specific norms. Now, yes, that, that is a different thing, but the outcome of that thing is exactly the same. <laughs> Recently, the National Football League has gotten in trouble for exactly the same logic, using exactly the same logic to deny claims based on concussions. Uh, and so here's how it plays out. Suppose you have two former NFL football players who are concerned that they have dementia from their exposure to football and they have neuropsych testing and the neuropsych tests produce the same score. What the NFL argues is that the white benchmarks at a population level are higher than neuropsych testing benchmarks are for black people, essentially pushing this old logic that white people are smarter than black people. And so the deviation from that norm is higher for the white player and the black player, and therefore the white player has more evidence of injury and is more entitled to compensation. It's exactly the same thing that the pulmonary function tests are doing. Now, my hope is that the NFL move and the attention this has gotten will be the straw that breaks the camel's back on this issue of disease and race. <clears throat> Senator Warren's office has now launched an, an investigation of the use of race-based algorithms in medicine. Uh, she leads with the NFL example to get people's attention and then pivots to focus on the medical work that has been done about the harms of race correction. And the House Ways and Means Committee has also uh, launched an investigation. And for this, I have to thank Michelle Morse, who spoke last week, uh, who's currently embedded in the House Ways and Means Committee as a policy analyst. Uh, she was able to orchestrate a response through that committee demanding information about this practice from the relevant medical societies. And I will be really interested to see what these investigations turn up and how organized medicine responds to this pressure about their misuse of race and disease. And so just to finish up, years ago, another one of our heroes in social medicine, Julius Richmond, described a model for how to bring about change in healthcare and health policy. He said, you need to have a knowledge base, a social strategy, and a political will. And I suspect Paul and Joya and Nancy might add a fourth issue here, direct action. You can always just act, take matters into your own hands. Now, overcoming race and racism is a great challenge for our current moment. The field of social medicine has long engaged in questions of race, disease, and medicine. And while the track record is imperfect, I think we have usually been on the right side of history in this work. The scholars in the field have critiqued, critiqued reductionism and determinism and have worked for health and racial justice. But there is clearly much more work that needs to be done. All of us have different talents. Mine may be as a researcher or a teacher or a mentor. Joya, Paul, Michelle, Salman, Nancy, and many others are implementers, as well as researchers, teachers, and mentors, and everything else. If we are to succeed, everyone needs to engage in whatever ways they can be most effective. And we have to work together uh, to bring our visions of a better future to fruition. So I will stop there and turn it over to Nancy. Nancy, I don't think we're hearing you. So I, um, oh, am I, okay. Well, now um, we are, now we are, go ahead. I'm here and um, David, that was spectacular. What a call to action. Um, I, I'm energized and um, Thank you. Uh, and uh, Salman and David, thank you for inviting me to join this amazing uh, seminar series. Um, it's an honor to be among, you know, the five presenters who have spoken so far who are all sort of um, both social medicine scholars and, you know, social medicine implementers. I need to say, I'm a social medicine practitioner, okay? Um, I'm not a scholar in social medicine. And my teachers have been the people of Boston and my own lived experience. So David asked me to share with you what I have learned about race and social medicine, and I will, but I have to do it from, uh, from, my, from my world, um, from this perspective. So in this field, context is everything. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little context about me. Uh, and I actually learned this from listening to uh, Alan's presentation. 
I am a Philadelphia Negro. Um, and it was reading W. Du Bois essay on the Philadelphia Negro that I realized that is who I am. So in, his, in the essay, he says, in the Negro's mind, color prejudice in Philadelphia is that widespread feeling of dislike for his blood, which keeps him and his children out of decent employment. On the other hand, most white people are quite unconscious of any such powerful vindictive, vindictive feelings. But the practical results of the attitude of most of the inhabitants of Philadelphia towards persons of Negro descent are the following. And he lists um, several different ways it plays out, but I wanna focus on one, as to work. No matter how well trained the Negro may be or how fitted for work of any kind, he cannot in the ordinary course of competition hope to be much more than a menial servant. Du Bois found this reality for women, for education, and for social intercourse. He wrote this in 1899. But this was the Philadelphia that my father taught me about. This was his Philadelphia. My father and his family came, uh, immigrated to Philadelphia from Haiti in uh, around 1915. His father had been a railroad engineer. He built trains, he ran trains, he repaired trains, he loved trains. He was a, a skilled medical metal worker. And he thought bringing his family to Philadelphia, um, he could you know, get work and continue you know, and have a good life. Well, after many failed attempts at getting a job, he finally got a job as a porter on the B&O Railroad. And as soon as he started to work, the porters went on strike because they didn't want to work with a black man. His heart was broken. His, his spirit was broken. He never worked again. And my father had to go straight from high school to supporting his family. So he never got to be the engineer he would have been. And my father, in order to support his family, um, he worked the majority of his life as a building superintendent until he wanted to help his two daughters go to college when he got a second job as a night watchman. And then like all working poor, he had no time for his own health. And so he died a premature death. My father was also an avid reader. And as I read Du Bois's essay, I heard the lessons my father had instilled in me about prejudice, distrust, and self, sort of self-efficacy. And it crystallized in me how I came to understand structural racism and where my practical knowledge of social medicine actually started. So my understanding of the social production as, of disease is embedded in the lived experience of, of uh, people you know, of growing up in Philadelphia. And as De David said, there are three pillars of social medicine, um, social production of disease, social meeting of disease, and social responses diseases which brings me to why I'm here. Um, it was the people of Boston who taught me about the social responses to the disease. And it's these lessons that David has asked me to share with you. So more context, I'm an anesthesiologist. Um, I live my life in the operating room. That is the world I knew. And I was specifically an an a obstetric anesthesiologist. So I spent uh, my time um, taking care of women in labor, which means I would spend a long time getting to know them and with them in sort of the, the trials and tribulations of childbirth. And it was in that environment, and as an anesthesiologist, you see many people in one day. So, you know, over my, you know, 15 years as an obstetric anesthesiologist, I took care of a lot of patients. Well, one particular patient um, uh, came, was brought in unconscious, um, and she had to have a stat section. And, you know, we, we immediately, you know, sort of took care of her. Uh, she was in distress, the baby was in distress um, and they survived. And so afterwards, I wanted to find out from her what had happened because at that time in Boston, all women, uh, all pregnant women had uh, health insurance. And I wanted to understand, you know, what had happened to this woman, you know, was it the lack of prenatal care? What was the problem? So when I talked to her, she said that she had, uh, health insurance. She had an obstetrician. She liked her obstetrician, but when she was uh, when she started having a headache, she didn't feel that she could um, ask her obstetrician about something so stupid. She didn't want to feel 
stupid. She, she didn't feel she was entitled to bother somebody. And she didn't understand that having a headache as a pregnant patient was a disaster. So she had a seizure at home and came in in distress. I took away from this, again, remember, I left Philadelphia a long time ago and became a Harvard trained anesthesiologist. I took away from this that there were people who didn't, you know, near in Boston, who didn't understand um, that they didn't understand their own health. They didn't understand um, how to reach out to resources. They didn't feel self confident enough to reach out to resources. Um, and they didn't feel like it, it, the healthcare system was made for them. So, I wanted to try to make that better. This is sort of, uh, you know, the response to a social to a social medicine issue. But I'm an anesthesiologist with no training in social medicine, so I did what I could do, which was go to the people of Boston and work with the people of Boston to figure out what's the problem and how do we fix it. Now it was sort of interesting at the around when this happened, which was 1992. There was a lot of discussion about infant mortality, and the conversation was that. Um, the solutions were uh, prenatal care uh, and insurance. And as I talked to the people of Boston, those were not the issues. The issue was more than transportation. It was more than insurance. It was more than prenatal care. It was knowledge, a sense that you're worthy of care and the, the ability to sort of access, access care and trust the care that was there. So with the people of Boston, we built the family van. And you saw a picture of that at the beginning. Well, the family van is now 28 years old. Um, it uh, goes into seven different communities in Boston. Um, we work with the community to decide what we would do, where we would do it, and how we would do it. And this gets to a couple of questions that David asked me. So he asked, uh, one, how did people feel about having Harvard um, folks come out into Boston? Well, the people who work on the van by design are community health workers. The, the program is run by community health workers. In 1992, they weren't called that back then, but that's what they were, and that's who they are. Um, the other issue is in Boston, there are an infinite number, a number of doctors and there are an infinite number of neighborhood health centers and they're all wonderful, but there are a lot of people who don't feel comfortable with any part of healthcare. So what's interesting, the family van by design is staffed by people from the community but has connections to the community health centers and, and to you know, the uh, major institutions. So this, this was what the people wanted. They didn't say, we don't want to go to the hospital. They just wanted to have a way to feel more comfortable as they access what was here. So this is, what, this is how I learned social medicine from the people of Boston. Um, the other comment you made was about disease being a motivator. Absolutely. And it motivates us as physicians and us as you know, scholars, but it really motivates the people who are living with it. And it's their brilliance that we should mine in order to start imagining new answers. It was the brilliance of the people of Boston. And when I say the people in Boston, I mean everyone. We talked to the community health workers, we talked to the CEOs of neighborhood health centers, we talked to the prostitutes, we rode on the women's awareness resource van. We talked, in fact, one of my main uh, collaborators was a, a lay midwifery group that was doing home, uh, attending home births in crack houses of women who refused to come into the hospital. They were our experts. They were the people who taught us what to do. And as a result, we have a 28 year old program that has, uh, that's alive and well, and uh, we have proven that we actually make people better. So that's what I've learned from my scholars, my scholars being the people of Boston, and I'm delighted to share it with you. Thank you so much, Nancy. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Nancy and, and David for just just an incredible uh, set of reflections. And maybe we'll open it up uh, to, to our group to, to ask any questions or share any thoughts or reflections that you have um, about, about uh, race and medicine and social medicine and working and learning from the community. People can either use the little blue bu button that you, know, that you can put your hand up with, or you can write in the in the chat that you have a question and and Marty and I will be able to see that and call on you.
and especially of course for our students our graduate students uh, you know this whole series is designed to to ensure that we're we're thinking about social medicine uh, um, together in a way that will construct better health delivery and more equitable health delivery for everybody so so feel free to ask any questions that you have that will help us in that in that mission. I see Denise. Uh, Denise, do you want to ask your question? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, actually, it's sort of a comment, but it'll roll into a question. Um, I am an emerita from Emory University School of Medicine. Uh, I'm a perinatologist last OBGYN currently. Uh, working on a book about implicit racial bias in medical education. And I think as we look for, forward to trying to um, diversify medical faculty, issues often come up about CVs, qualifications, et cetera. And, and that's the source of the problem when when you know Harvard is looking around for who should they hire for faculty positions, there isn't a broad swath. Now, part of that is the result of the fact that African Americans drop out early in the search because we spend our time coping in a hostile environment that is full of uh, implicit racial bias that continues to denigrate us and people just get tired of it. But there are also the fi financial considerations. So people have a lot of debt, academics pay less than private practice. So they fall out there. But even the people who stay in academic medicine are often burdened with extra chores because diversity is assigned to them. So they have to spend their time on diversity committees. They spend time trying to mentor other African-Americans in the environment. They spend time just uh, soothing wounds and trying to provide social shelter for people below them. All that time takes away from their ability to build their CVs, right? So they don't, in the end, have the kind of qualifications that all of these search committees are looking for. So part of the process has to be a change in the way the criteria uh, for who should be advanced um, will are evaluated because there are lots of candidates who actually are appropriate and who've done a lot of work around um, getting research done, but they that they haven't had time to get the props that then show up on their CV. And also, frankly, they lack support from departmental mentors who push them forward to get the opportunities to do those things. David, Nancy, any, any reflections on what Denise has, has laid out so clearly? Yes, I, I think we'll both have something to say here. So first, I, I think I, I agree with 100% with everything that you said about the nature of the problem, the nature of the obstacles. Um, though one of the things that frustrates me, and I think everyone, is that that diagnosis has been recognized now for long enough that we ought to have been have done better than we have in responding to it. I, I don't know what you would whether you would say that Emory has been more successful at this than Harvard has been. But just speaking from the perspective of Harvard, um, we have known what the obstacles are and haven't found a way yet to overcome them. Now, as I say that, I'm, I'm channeling uh, a friend and colleague, Joan Reed, uh, who at the medical school has often been tasked as the person to carry the burden of diversity and diversity work. And she and Nancy have often found themselves in that role uh, over the decades. Uh, whenever I complain to Joan that you know, we try to get more faculty uh, in the teaching roles, but there just aren't enough underrepresented faculty at the medical school. She'll say, David, that's not true at all. Harvard Medical School has 12,000 faculty, counting all the hospitals. That means that Harvard actually does have more African-American faculty than most other medical schools in the country. Uh, 
you just haven't been able to find and recruit them and bring them into the courses. Uh, and uh, on a empirical basis, I mean, I, sh sh she's right about that in many respects. Uh, and the question is, you know, what have been the challenges? And I think the challenges are the ones that uh, Denise has laid out, the people who are uh, in high demand for teaching to diversify the faculty are in high demand for many other factors. And how do you make progress on this uh, without adding to the burden that these people already face uh, in their lives? One way to do that would be by having, just figuring out ways to increase the numbers of people. Uh, yeah. and that, the, that has proven hard to do despite effort now for decades. Nancy, I'd be curious to hear your perspective on this from having been inside the medical school administration for so many years. So Denise, I completely agree with everything you said. Um, and in fact, I sort of add two more problems that I see. So um, I was Dean of Students for uh, 19 years. And um, everything you feel as a faculty is what students you know, everywhere at Harvard feel um, in the world they're in. So, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, um, the tax of racism is there at all times. Um, I had a, um, a student who was, uh, who came to see me more or less in tears and it was sort of, um, you know, after, you know, it was uh, sort of several years ago. And he, he was very upset because he'd been walking down the street studying for his exam and he was thinking about his exam. And then he saw at a distance two white women clutch their pocketbooks. And he crossed the street because he didn't want to make them feel, you know, uncomfortable. But he was so upset that he just wanted to study for his exam. And he had, you know, he had to waste his time and energy. And it just hurt that, that he had to think about that, whereas somebody else could just walk down the street and not, and not worry about that. Um, his studying was impacted by the racism of people walking down the street. Um, so I hear what you're saying and I, I, I double it. The other thing is uh, a group of us, um, uh, one, of, one of the issues is a lot of people um, who feel compelled to do, as you're saying, you know, the, the, um, to, to actually build the social medicine solutions, um, when you do that, you don't necessarily get credit for that. And so there are a lot, there are people who feel compelled by their, because of race to give back and do work that's actually not going to be um, academically valued. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I do think that there is a move afoot at least to broaden the categories of what, we, what is considered academically valuable. Um, and that might begin to help, but um, I, I I don't have an answer, and I completely agree with what you're saying. I think we have Sarah with her hand up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, great. Hi, my name is Sarah Emerson. Um, I'm actually not a uh, medical student. Um, I'm studying at the University of Oxford in uh, an executive MBA program, but I was at the Kennedy School uh, previously. And by way of background, um, been in a variety of sectors, but spent uh, close to five years. Um, uh, basically, CDC uh, was paying me, but I was hired by the president of Tanzania, seconded to Ministry of Health and Social Welfare to build um, some of the, the very earliest uh, national scale M Health solutions. Um, so, yeah, I had a few questions. If if you um, would like to answer any one of them, um, or or um, uh, yeah, if any of them are interesting, I know there's other hands up. Um, I'm curious to what extent the specifically um, within within Harvard um, and then also more broadly with your collaborators that that there's a movement um, to you know either in in earnest in some of the, the training um, but also in the advocacy work um, to move farther upstream and um, you know getting out in front of um, you know I would say in particular some of the the issues where we see the the comorbidities and understanding that that now we even have is it metabetes and um, but specifically related to uh, mental health concerns um, in in minority communities where um, again access to care tends to be um, more limited um, and then taking into account what I don't think is that controversial related to epigenetics of you know the multi generational impact of the chronic stress. Um, you know, lack of access to, to nutrition, basic services, et cetera. Um, 
so curious again, sort of what's the movement upstream? Um, and in particular, as we think uh, not only within the current context and recognizing the stress of COVID, um, but also um, people of color um, and other marginalized groups. Um, you know, I think this moment is probably quite, um, you know, quite a lot to be going through and, and traumatic. Um, and I worry about how that might be treated and not, um, you know, over medicalizing or um, pharma. Uh, David, you're better than me, at, um, <laughs> Dr. Pharma pharmacolization, um, you know, of mental health distress. And in particular, um, with the aging population, you know, uh, looking at, at all the relationships between uh, loneliness, isolation, and, and, um, and other, you know, sort of downstream, uh, you know, health challenges. So, so again, sort of a lot there, but I'm wondering about, um, you know, what we can do um, to get farther upstream, in particular related to mental health, but also some of these uh, more upstream uh, potential causes. Um, and then, um, yeah, to the extent uh, there's time or interest, or we could come back to it, time permitting, uh, I'm curious about community engagement just from a human centered design uh, approach um, to the extent that, that the community has been involved not only in design potentially of treatments and interventions, but also in problem identification. Um, and then my, my current work is um, I'm consulting for uh, a very large international technology company that um, I believe in earnest is, is working to, um, you know, ultimately eliminate uh, social injustice and, and racial inequality. Um, so I'm curious if you might have recommendations. Um, I could follow up with you afterwards around how to engage, um, you know, in, in helping sort of the tech for good, the ICT for D. Um, you know, whether it be the 3D uh, printing and so on, but, but how we can contribute from a private sector um, standpoint. So apologies to be so long-winded, thank you. So uh, David, I could take the community engagement part because that, that is, um, so it was clear to me growing up in North Philadelphia and then working at Harvard Medical School um, you know, right next to Mission Hill, that the only way to, um, to be effective was to leave the four walls and actually go into the community. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, we, you know, people now are talking about co-design, you know, uh, you know patient-centered design and things like that. Uh, it has always been possible to actually go and talk to the people in the community, work with them. And, and it's not this sort of after the fact, it's sort of like before the fact. Like as soon as you feel the, you want to make a difference, go and spend time with the man on the street and find out how you can. And the man on the street's been living in this and thinking about this for a long time and they have a lot of ideas. You might have resources and knowledge that, that he doesn't have. And so together you can make it happen, but it's actually being out there. So we created the community engagement clerkship for fourth year Harvard medical students. And we embed them entirely either for a month in the family van or a month in Boston Healthcare for the Homeless or in um, Alaska at the NUCA system of healthcare. And the students um, are there first and foremost to just listen. They're not there to fix anything. And they all walk away, you know, having realized that one, they had never ever really listened. They had always sort of said, oh, where's the problem and how can I fix it? And I'll even work with you to fix it. But the, to just not, uh, not try to lead it, but rather uh, listen and learn and follow. And they all left saying that it was transformative, that they had, not, they had never um, actually stepped outside of their comfort zone into the shoes of the people who they were trying to help, but into, and, and to see them as the brilliant, successful, energetic people they are, and not see them as poor, marginalized, you know, at risk. I mean, we who live in communities like this, we don't think we're poor and marginalized. You know, we think we're pretty smart. We think we've done good stuff. You know, we think we have good ideas. And so um, putting students in a world where they can learn that, um, where they can feel that, uh, actually changes how they, changes the kinds of doctors they become. So uh, my, my suggestion is to just, you know, get out of your uh, comfort zone and go out in the street. And thank you for the clapping hands. <laughs> then in, in terms of the, the first part of that question, uh, I'll, I'll do my best here to, to, to channel uh, 
Paul, who I think would say in response to this, uh, that you know, to, to engage the community, you want to, to find out what the people want. And so he'll, he'll tell the story that when he first went to Haiti as a recent graduate, undergraduate graduate from Duke uh, University, he was spent time in the, in the village and the village had many challenges. These are the damn refugees that he describes in AIDS and accusation. And so he and the priest he was working for asked what they wanted and they said they wanted a school. The priest said, okay, we're, we're on that. That's what the church knows how to do, build a school. And they also said they wanted a clinic. And since Paul was about to start Harvard Medical School, he was not yet a student, uh, he was tasked with being responsible for building this clinic. Uh, but so, you know, it's community engagement through responding to community needs. Now, the upstream very question is, is, a, is a challenging one. You can see this in Virchow's work. You know, when he went to Silesia, what was his number one treatment recommendation? Full and unlimited democracy. He wanted a fundamental restructuring of the relationship between these people and the colonizing power of Prussia. But he also understood that that might not happen overnight. And in the meantime, there were many pragmatic things you could do to improve the conditions of these people until full and unlimited democracy was achieved. Uh, and you can see something similar in Paul's work. Again, if you look at AIDS and accusation, you know, the, the fundamental problem is that the, the land of the, these people who lived in Kanj was stolen from them to make space for a hydroelectric dam, which flooded their fertile lowlands and consigned them to a life in poverty in the barely fertile Haitian highlands. Uh, you know, giving them a clinic is a, is a band-aid. It doesn't pr provide the fundamental structural reforms you would want to maximally benefit this population, but it is something that you could do that would provide relief for them. So there is value in doing so. Uh, as the people who have worked directly in, in PIH, which I haven't done, but they will say, you know, PIH has always worked more broadly just than just providing band-aids and medications and clinics. Uh, I don't know what the current numbers are, someone on the call might, but there have been times where Partners in Health has been the largest employer in Haiti, employing thousands of community health workers. Uh, and that creates a virtuous cycle where provision of care provides good jobs for people who then have more money to invest in the economy, which then has collateral benefits. And so there are various ways you can do that. And so I think most people in our orbit would say that it's essential to work for both of those things, to have an eye on the upstream changes that everyone would want, um, but also to act in the meantime to do stuff that can be done right now to, to relieve suffering. And that's probably even truer for mental health than it is for other areas of healthcare because the treatments for mental health are often more frustrating. You know, there is no equivalent of antibiotics for psychiatric disease. Now, I don't want to suggest a nihilist position here. Uh, Many of our colleagues in this department have, have made great progress here. So Vikram Patel, you know, in some respects has transformed the field of global mental health by showing what can be accomplished with lay therapists to extend the reach and accessibility of psychiatric care. And one of the most surprising things I ever heard in, in, a, in a talk at Harvard was probably about 10 years ago now, I was co-teaching a class with Byron and Mary Jo Good. And Byron was describing his experiences working with uh, the population of Aceh in Indonesia who have been traumatized both by decades of civil war and then also by the Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, and so this was a population that had many, many sources of um, psychic distress. And he was someone as an anthropologist, not a clinician who had spent his life often critiquing Western biomedical approaches as not up to the challenge of recognizing the full complexity of psychiatric phenomenology. And so here he is talking to medical students and they said, well, what do you do in this population? And he said, you know, sometimes uh, Prozac uh, and Clonopin are really, really useful medicines. Uh, and I almost fell over my, in my chair when I heard Byron endorsing the use of antidepressants and anti-anxiety medicines in a post-conflict traumatized population. But I think he was reflecting that insight that you see in Paul's work and you see in Virchow, that you can, that there is an ideal that you want to work towards that would relieve this population from its trauma. But that shouldn't stop us from doing what we can do in the short term to try to provide relief. If nothing else, you know, the kind of relief that these people might get from Prozac and Clonopin might help them engage more successfully in improving the structural uh, obstacles that they face. And so I think one of the messages of social medicine is the necessity of pursuing these challenges on every front possible uh, in hopes of achieving success. Yeah, I think we have a, a question much. from we have a question from Iqbal. 
Yes, hi. Um, how are you doing? Um, so I, um, I live in Miami. Um, my family is originally from Tanzania, and I grew up in rural Louisiana. Um, and for a long time, I think, um, you know, sort of within our family, there's a, a strong tradition of um, social justice work. So this is more directed um, towards Professor Oriel. Um, I, we, we live in Miami, um, so I'm an associate professor in Islamic studies. Um, so I'm not like specifically directly directly related to health, but we live in Brownsville, which is a historically um, black part of Miami um, during the time of segregation, and, and it has suffered uh, quite immensely um, since the time of segregation. Um, and so we've you know developed a foundation. We're trying to develop. Um, we've developed a community garden. We're doing educational programs and stuff like that. One of the big questions. Um, that is particularly my wife has, and that's kind of why I wanted to ask you is that every day when we drive down the street um, to get to the university, there are um, women who are um, working the street and um, there is a crack house that's, that's near sort of the intersection of, of the road. And from what we can see in Miami, there's nothing, there doesn't appear to be anything that is, being done except for the fact that um, AIDS kits are handed out um, and sort of, you know, lubricants and sort of condoms and stuff like that. And so my question is like, based on your research, you know, in your work and your sort of social activism, what are some kind of, um, what are ways that we, you know, I, I'm trained as a historian, so I don't really have training sort of, you know, in public health, but it's something that I, you know, we're passionate about trying to serve the community and trying to help people, and particularly the women who are struggling. And all we have is in Miami, from my, from my understanding, and, you know, other people can correct me if I'm wrong, it's just these sort of stopgap measures. And then if people want to go to a clinic or they can go to a women's shelter, a Lotus Women's House um, in Miami. So what are some ways, what are some maybe innovative things that are happening or, uh, perspectives from your own, um, uh, you know, sort of time working with it, with the community, with the bus and things like that, where, you know, we could try to experiment or implement things in Miami to sort of help this, this very vulnerable population. So um, that's a great question. And um, thank you for the, the, the amazing work you're doing. So um, when the family van started, the community wanted it as a place, as a safe haven. And so I, I, if I was gonna generalize at all, is uh, building safe havens within these areas that feel distressed. Um, and so in the safe haven, uh, the people in those communities, many of them actually want change, um, yeah. but don't know how, don't yeah. have the resources, um, and so what the family van became was a safe haven. And people would come to the van and be accepted and not judged for, you know, for their lives. And then they could access the resources we had when they wanted to. And I think the point is that change happens from inside a person. What right. you can do is be there with the resources necessary uh, to help them. Um, you know, you should go on the, there's a, thefamilyvan.org is our website. And on the very first page, halfway down, there's an interview by uh, Andrew. And it's spectacular. It, it just describes it perfectly. So he came to the van, you know, as most people do for something minor, um, and then build a relationship with the people. And the people are, yes, community health workers, but we also have medical students, you know, but the, the, the fundamental structure is the community health worker staff but he built relationship with people who didn't judge him and who gave him um, access to resources so that he could change himself um, over time. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could go on forever with family van stories of people who came from a place of distress and we gave them, to be quite honest, love and hope. Um, and when they were ready to make the next step, we were able to help, help you know, sort of, provide the resources to help them make the next step. And this is in a city in Boston where there's a doctor in every corner, you know? So mm -hmm. why was, you know, the need is there no matter what environment you're in. But I think it's the safe haven in which people can then, and the safe haven is a place that doesn't judge, doesn't trust, you know, do, doesn't, you know, um, try to fix people, doesn't try to sort of say, okay, you've got a problem, here's the solution that simply listens. 
and simply helps people do what's most important to them, which is oftentimes not what's most important to you at all. You know, so listening. it is really, you know, really just listening. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And hopefully, you know, if you don't mind, I'll be in touch with you. Um, hopefully as we develop it in Miami. Please do. Thank you. We have a question from uh, one of one of our graduate students, Emiliano. Hi. Um, so uh, as uh, Dr. Kratavji said, I'm a, a medical student and um, hoping to, uh, in my career, engage in the practice of medicine and also research. And so I was um, curious to hear about uh, sort of your own personal engagement uh, with the work that you do and, and how you got there, because both of you deal with the effects of uh, persistent uh, racist understandings of history. Um, you know, for example, um, I, I took a course uh, with Dr. Jones as an undergrad, um, and I can't tell you how many times I speak to someone and then speaking about the history of medicine in the US and then virgin soil theory comes up. And um, when, when there are, are ideas um, such as that, such as you know, the limitation th that uh, the general public is very limited in their ability to engage with their own health. When you, that when you have ideas that are so in deeply embedded um, within uh, not only the general public, but the medical establishment as well, uh, I'm curious to hear about uh, what strategies uh, you both have used uh, to move that conversation. Um, what is your own understanding uh, or what is your understanding of your own role in both the short and long term at this nexus of uh, academic engagement, uh, policy engagement and practice, a uh, praxis. And, and uh, sort of uh, as a follow up then, uh, what helps you stay engaged and motivated um, and prevents that nihilism uh, that you spoke about from uh, sneaking in? Yeah, so, so the, I mean, I, I could talk forever about my frustrations about the in endurance of virgin soil theory uh, in American public discourse, and the you know this this time period between uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, until recently and still mostly considered Columbus Day, and Thanksgiving is such a funny time or frustrating time. I mean, Joe Gong could speak much more evocatively about this than I could about what what that's like for the Indigenous population of the Americas to have these two days continue to be celebrated when they mean such different things to different people. Uh, I don't carry that burden myself. I carry the burden of an incredibly vexed uh, researcher who has to listen during this two month period every year to story after story after story in progressive venues in New York Times, on NPR, uh, where this theory you know, gets brought out and sees the light of day. And again, suggests that there was something wrong with American Indians and that's why they died. And I think that's such a dangerous precedent uh, to have that continually re reinserted into public discourse because every time something goes wrong, the default in so much of the American population is to turn to these intrinsic factors of susceptibility. Uh, you can see this with COVID. You know, one of the things that people recognized by early April was that COVID, like most epidemics, was taking a dire toll on minority populations in this country that included African Americans, Hispanic Americans, American Indians. Uh, not Alaska Natives for inter interesting and complicated reasons, at least so far. <clears throat> and it was just a matter of time before you'd start to see people making genetic explanations. And sure enough, there was an article published in JAMA back in September, uh, identifying some allele of some prostate related gene. And the researchers were arguing that this is what was contributing to the vulnerability of African Americans in this country. Uh, and it's just so frustrating to see that that default be so hard to budge. Um, and the resistance comes from every level. I gave Grand Brown, or I gave a seminar at, at Brown University once, and the most senior American historian at Brown said that what I was saying couldn't be true because if it was, then he has been teaching his students incorrectly for his whole career, and that just wasn't possible. And it was hard to figure out a polite way to respond to that. Uh, I remember one year, in the social medicine class for first year medical students, a student came up to me afterwards and said, again, I had to be wrong because Jared Diamond had been his undergraduate advisor at UCLA and Jared Diamond was such a wonderful person. There was no way he was mistaken about this. Uh, and you know, th these ideas have a whole range of deep appeals. Uh, I had my first published, I thought change would come quickly. 
now I realize I'll spend the rest of my career trying to re-educate people about this point uh, in hopes of progress being made. Uh, but I think anyone engaged in any of this racial justice work has to have that long view because we're not gonna get overnight solutions to this. Nancy, did you wanna add anything to that? So, um, I, yes, I, 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 you know, I agree, you know, with what you're saying and how you feel. What's interesting is um, as an anesthesiologist, my um, scholarship is all about blood gases and, you know, um, things, you know, sort of how nerves are working um, and not so much about the social side, whereas my action is out on the street in the social side. So um, keeping the two separate has been wonderful for me, you know, um, and in my work on the street, um, I guess what I feel I can do is bring the voice of the street into the voice of the academy. And we've done things like interviewed our patients, um, you know, or not our patients, you know, done interviews um, and then sort of done an analysis of why people come to see us and, um, you know, what role we play. In fact, uh, Dr. Richmond was one of our advisors and he knew the successes we were having. And he said, our job was now to crystallize why and share that with mainstream healthcare. Now, um, so I think there is something to learning from the successes that are out there and bringing them into mainstream healthcare. Um, but how we change the minds and hearts of, um, of medicine uh, is, is a, another problem. I mean, uh, having a clerkship for senior medical students in community engagement is a lovely thing, but it, that is not, doesn't even come up to incremental. That's like a couple people at a time and that's it. So um, yes, we need to change the hearts and minds of an entire profession. Well, Nancy, this is a good segue to a question from one of our students, Nana Jay, who's written it down and him and I have had a back and forth to clarify it. He wants to know, um, have you, what has it been like as a woman of color trying to go, you know, break through medicine and work in these communities? Like, what, what, what was it like? What were the challenges you faced? And what strategies did you use to overcome that? So um, that great question, um, a specific, especially since um, because of the way I look, people often assume I'm white. And depending where I am, people assume I'm white or not. Uh, so it puts me in a very interesting position uh, as to what I hear and how I am reacted, how people react to me. Um, so when I went into the community, and again, I'm from Philadelphia, I'm not from Boston. So I was going into a community that was not my home, but I went in and it felt like home to me. And I think the, my reaction to being at home meant everybody I was with felt like I was part of their home. Um, and you know, so part of the way people think about you, treat you, react to you, understand you is how you are thinking about them, treating them and reacting to them. So it, you know, it, it's way easier for me to feel at home in Mission Hill than it was for me to feel at home in Chestnut Hill. Um, and therefore, I was accepted as a member of the community. Um, the family van, which was designed by the community, was accepted by the community. In fact, David asked me, how do people think about a, a Harvard van coming around? No one sees it as a Harvard van. Everyone sees it as their van. Um, so where you, being comfortable in your own skin in these different environments is sort of what makes it work. I need to say, um, it's there is an uphill battle. Um, I was invited to be on the board of uh, trustees at the uh, Beth Israel Hospital. And I was invited because I'd started the van and they were proud of the work I'd done and they, they wanted to have community representation. Um, they wanted to hear what I had to say. And one of my close friends said to me, oh, well, you got that position because you're a twofer. You're a woman and a minority. So, you know, you go through, you, you get these onslaughts all the time. And all you do is, um, I don't know, uh, let it roll off of you. And I guess now that I understand that my father had, was training me from W.B. Du Bois perspective, it was do your work, move on. But to be quite honest, um, don't trust. You know, I always was, you know, um, I didn't know that I truly, I didn't, I didn't expect that I would be truly accepted and loved by the 
white academy that I had become part of. And if you don't expect it, then you're not hurt when you find out you're not. So when you know my colleagues said, "Oh, you're a twofer," you know, didn't didn't um, didn't pull the rug out from under me. I wouldn't have expected anything different. It's still a tax, though, which is really interesting. It's a tax on your psyche, yes. uh, David. There's been a couple of comments about Virkov. Um, you know, uh, uh, Professor Hildebrand said there are no heroes. However, while he did not actively change things in Silesia, he did become a liberal politician and sit in the Berlin Parliament, helping establish sanitation works to stop cholera. And Ileana said just a small remark. One of the main issues in Silesia was a colonial situation: rich, rich German, poor Poles. And one of Virkov's main recommendations was to allow schooling in the native language that is Polish. Uh, maybe you want to reflect. I think you were pointing out that that he was a man of his time, but <laughs> um, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about that. No, I, I, I certainly agree with both of those those points. The you know, when we we used to teach that case at Harvard Medical School as part of a global medicine discussion, and people would say, "What? Why is this? Why are you talking about Russia, Prussia, and Silesia in a global medicine course?" And it's because of that colonial context. You have people trying to deliver care against barriers of wealth and power and culture and language and everything else. Uh, and so that's a, the point about uh, recommending schooling in the native language uh, is, is spot on about the kinds of things that uh, Virchow thought would be needed to help. Um, and yes, uh, Sabina is, is, is right that even though uh, he came and went from Silesia, he devoted his career to these progressive causes. And I was thinking about him the other day, you know, one of the things he's most famous for is very late in his career, challenging Bismarck to a duel, because he felt like that was the thing that needed to be done. And I keep having this fantasy that maybe Tony Fauci will challenge Donald Trump to a duel uh, to, to see, see what would happen. Uh, but, but I also saw that Arthur had his hand up, and I want to hear. Yeah, Arthur. Yeah, Arthur can have the final word. In fact, the final question. Yeah, I, I want to actually ask a question of Manson, uh, whose work I've appreciated so very much as a virtually every member of this department. And Nancy, I um, I just chaired a memorial minute for Chet Pierce, and uh, on that committee is Tony Earls, uh, uh, Gus uh, uh, White. David Henderson um, and Ann Becker. So, um, and uh, uh, I, I ref in the memorial minute, I wrote something that Chet told me around 1999, 2000, uh, uh, which was that uh, having graduated from Harvard College, graduated from Harvard Medical School, been on the faculty for 30 years, um, he never felt comfortable at Harvard. And it was a, a, a telling comment that uh, I've never forgotten. And I put it into the Memorial Minute with the strong support of my, uh, of my colleagues. And I want, you, I want you to reflect on this a little bit about um, uh, feeling comfortable because you used the term so beautifully when you talked about being in uh, North Philadelphia and also going into um, uh, minority areas of Boston uh, that you felt comfortable. Um, Chet was an outstanding, maybe one of the greatest psychiatrists we've ever had at Harvard. He did. He he was a Harvard person, he, but he said he never felt comfortable here. He was making some statement about the micro level of racism, which he was very concerned about. He had had a theory, as you know, of microaggression and microcanalization of, of anger um, uh, and thought that in, in white black relations uh, everywhere, but, but he was thinking particularly in his own experience at Harvard, that whites always controlled the uh, space, the time, the mobility and the energy. Those were his, those were his comments. And I'd just like you to reflect on, you know, you've been here, you've been a dean here, You've, you've 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 worked here a long time. What's your own experience, and what's the what's the implication of it for racial justice in our own school? Wow, I wish it hadn't ended there, <laughs> because your question actually brought me to tears. So, um, when all the years that I worked at the Beth Israel Hospital and speak about feeling loved and wanted and accepted there. Uh, 
when I would go from one building to the next, I usually went through the basement because I felt comfortable there. Um, that's where my father worked. So there is a discomfort. Do you feel there's something we can do about that? That we, we should be doing right now about that? Well, I think you are. I think this is. Um, I think individuals do it all of the time. Um, I mean, there are people who, you know, you just know, and I say it's how you feel. Um, so you feel the love and you feel the respect. Um, and mixed in with that, again, is your, um, your own sense of self, you know, um, is, and I know this is true of every, you know, every student at Harvard always felt they got in through the back door, okay? Well, you really feel that if, if you know, you were told repeatedly that you got in through the back door. Um, so that, that is a, a, a ground from which you have to elevate yourself um, because it is um, a, a perception you have taken on. But I think it's back to the question of uh, what do you do for the prostitutes and you know the crack houses in Florida? Um, it's small, it's incremental, it's opening the door, it's being trustworthy. I don't know that a magic wand can change it. Um, what is interesting when I think back to um, you know sexual harassment, so you know, working in the operating room, needless to say, the world of um, improper sexual innuendo was the standard uh, in that world. And then all of a sudden uh, it became illegal. And so people kept telling you, you can't act like that. You know, and so there was a little bit of less acting like that, but then there started being women um, department chair and the world changed. So there is a, point of when you're in a space where the people around you and the people in power start reflecting, looking like your world, then it, start, then it starts to feel more comfortable. So I think the same will happen when there, you know, when there are more people in various positions of power and not just, you know, the, the, you know, the diversity. I mean, it's, it's sort of like the, um, the black tax and the, the ghetto. Um, it's sort of, that's when people will start feeling more comfortable. The students, um, the first year students used to come and uh, volunteer on the family van because they said it was a cure for longwood itis. So yeah, there's a little inflammation and we have to work on fixing it. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Well, everyone, this has just been an inc incredibly uh, insightful session. I want to thank Professor Nancy Oriel, Professor David Jones. I, I hope uh, uh, I can see in the comments that people have had a had a really uh, interesting uh, have had interesting questions, interesting insights. I hope for our students, you know, we're able to see how to tease out some of these issues of race and history. And I think Nancy's point here at the end has just been really insightful for me personally because. You know, we're focusing on changing faculty, we're focusing on students, but we're part of this very broad network of administrators, of other people, and you have to really think about what kind of wholesale transformation we're going to need to create the type of world that we want, especially in, in medicine and healthcare. So thank you everyone for joining us, and we will, uh, we will regroup, I believe, Marty, is it in two weeks? Um. I think, I think two weeks, I'm sorry, let me check. Yeah. Really well, you guys will get a, we'll, we'll, we'll set out a flyer, but we believe that it's in two weeks from today. This was the odd week where it was, it was uh, one week from the previous one, but we'll regroup in two weeks and look forward to seeing everyone for the next pro seminar. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.